All right. I am absolutely delighted to have Dr. Andrew Doyle here, who has written a fantastic new book, which he gave me the pleasure of of reading. And so thank you. So thank you, Dr. Doyle, if I call you Andrew. So uh, t tell us about the the book, the title, the number of pages. Give us some specifics <laughs> about yourself and then the book. OK, the book is called The New Puritans, How the uh, Religion of Social Justice Captured the Western World. Uh, and I suppose what it is, is a, a sort of I've been writing about this subject for a number of years now, and this is, I suppose, my attempt to distill my thoughts about it into one place, uh, which is why I, I I source everything. I make sure that uh, the, the book sort of catalogues what's been going on yeah. over the past 10 years, um, in particular with the rise of what we call critical social justice and the impact that that's had. And one of the reasons I wanted to write the book is because I feel that one of the reasons why uh, this is spreading so quickly throughout the Western world is that there is a general misapprehension of what it is we're dealing with. And people generally don't understand what it is. And the reason for that is that this is a movement that uses very progressive sounding language. It uses phrases such as social justice, which sounds wonderful, anti-racism, which sounds wonderful because we're all opposed to racism, uh, phrases such as equity, which people aren't think is the same as equality, but it isn't. Right. Um, and it, even using the phrase progressive, using the phrase liberal, you know, all of these things are misleading because actually this is a movement that is very illiberal. It is very right. regressive. It, it it creates more racial division. Uh, it, 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 it creates more inequality. It does all of the things that are directly opposite to the language with which it describes itself. And obviously people are very confused because most people are just decent people and they want everyone to have an equal shot at life and they want to help those who are vulnerable uh, and marginalized. And then when they hear, see this movement coming along using all these phrases, they think, oh, well, I'll, I'll get on board with that. I, I don't want anyone to be treated badly because of the color of their skin or their sexual orientation or their gender or whatever. And they don't realize that what it is they are supporting is 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 precisely the opposite. It's very very regressive. So I'm trying to explain in the book where this has come from, uh, why it's why it's what its aims are, how it how it couches a lot of its aims in progressive sounding language, um, and how really uh, the way to push back against it is firstly we have to understand it. So it's it's the culture war I think is about who gets to define the meaning of words right. and these ideologues will often try and uh, muddy the waters by using terms that you think you understand in a different way. And so that's why I needed to write something that was accessible, that goes through it in a sort of systematic way, not just its origins, but what it's doing now, giving multiple examples of how this movement has infected all of our major cultural, educational, political institutions in the UK, it's here, it, everywhere. It's in our uh, National Health Service in the UK, it's in our police, it's in our judiciary. It's in our army. So you know, on, 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 yeah, everywhere. I mean, on the day that Putin invaded Ukraine, uh, the um, Ministry of Defense was tweeting about the LGBT plus coffee morning it had when it was talking about pansexuality, you know, and that sounds trivial and silly and we, we can make fun of it. But <laughs> that's the Ministry of Defense, right? So right. it matters. It wouldn't matter if this was just a bunch of screaming activists online with anime avatars who were sort of shouting into the void and we just ignored them but the people in power don't ignore them they capitulate to them and uh, worse still a lot of those activists now occupy positions of power in the west and so that's why it's really important to tackle it okay so I, so many questions okay so um what do you think when just the average person who's not completely absorbed this stuff like you and I, what do you think the average person thinks about when they hear equity, social justice, anti-race, like what's running through their head? Well, uh, the terms are not clear and that is a, a deliberate tactic on, on the part of activists. So uh, when they hear those terms, they assume that we're talking about very sort of positive things and they assume that uh, equity means the same as equality is in not not discriminating against people due to their immutable characteristics. Right. And that, that, that's, some, that's the sort of foundational premise of a liberal society. Uh, and so they think they're merely supporting that. They think that they're merely supporting a continuation of the civil rights movement from the 1960s. Right. Martin Luther King's dream of colorblindness, where not that we don't notice race, but that we don't treat people differently on the basis of race. And, and people think that this is just a continued form of that. In fact, it's, it's the, actually the opposite of that. The opposite. The end point of critical social justice is racial segregation, as we have seen explicitly 
Uh, some of the examples I give in the book are the Brentwood School in California, where they segregated parents for after school dialogue sessions with teachers and they segregated them by skin color. So it was literally white parents go here and others go here. There was no indication of what mixed race parents ought to do in that situation. In London, we have a school called the American School in London, uh, which is the, the UK's most expensive day school. Um, and they were segregating children for after school activities by skin color. This is not what Martin Luther King had in mind. Um, so that's the, that's what people, people are, understanding or comprehending this movement on a very superficial level mm. and 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 part of the reason why we need more accessible discussions about this is because the activists blindside people with jargon uh, a lot of this is coming from academe a lot mm. of this is coming from from people with a doctor in their name with phds who uh who 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 deliberately obfuscate uh through through shibboleths academic shibboleths that don't really um make sense in the real world and and so i think accessibility is a major issue but also i think something that's really worth people thinking about is that w or is the extent to which we have come to just accept uh this trajectory uh and that i think is a real problem and i if you go back if you could say to yourself if you could talk to the person you were 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and say, by the way, when we reach 2022, <laughs> we will have, you know, uh, we will have uh, school boards burning books and if they, if they contain outdated stereotypes and calling it a flame purification ceremony. We will have teachers telling children that there are over 100 genders. We will have uh, police arresting people for non-crime hate incidents, which happens thousands of times every year in the UK. You know, you will you will have schools segregating people by their skin color. Uh, you know, all of this stuff, if you would have said this. And, and, yeah. And also what I think is one of the most disturbing things, the mutilation of children's genitals and the complicity of the entire medical establishment. Yes. The psychologists, the school system. No one would have believed that. Like no, no one 15 years ago, not even the activists themselves, I think, would have believed that was possible in a liberal and sane society. It is happening. The the. The issue you allude to there is one of the worst, I think, because Clearly. You know, when you promote gender identity ideology to children and you say that if you're a little boy who likes wearing dresses and makeup and or doesn't like football, or if you're a little girl who who doesn't who who likes playing football, likes climbing mountains, whatever, that, that you're not necessarily a boy or a girl because you don't conform to really old fashioned, ultra conservative stereotypes of what it means to be a man and a woman. Um, and then you fast track those kids onto puberty blockers, which then go on to cross sex hormones. And you tell them that these medica that there's no, nothing harmful about this medication. It's reversible. All the studies are telling us that that's not totally the case. False. But you don't even make the effort to, to check before doing this. And this is promoted by the NHS, by the government. I mean, we had a, a clinic called the Tavistock Clinic in the UK, right. which was a gender pediatric clinic, which was effectively pushing through these ideas and they knew i mean the whistleblowers from the tavistock made it clear a lot of the parents who were coming there with their kids a lot of it was to do with homophobia they didn't like the fact that they had a little boy who was effeminate you know a lot of it was driven and sometimes the kids themselves are, are struggling with that element most children who, who exhibit gender non-conforming traits end up being gay in later life that's just the reality of it studies have confirmed that again and again and so what you're effectively doing and a lot of them are aut autistic as well. So what you're effectively doing here is medicalizing and sterilizing gay kids. Um, yeah, I mean, and that it, is, I mean, that's shocking stuff, but they're doing it in the name of progress. Right. And a lot of the people involved think they're doing something progressive. And it's, it's utterly horrific. Can I just say at the Tavistock, there was a dark joke amongst staff members. They used to joke to each other and saying, soon there will be no gay people left. They knew what was going on. They knew what the implications of what they were doing led to and uh, nothing was done. And I, I think this is one of the biggest medical scandals of our time. We're already seeing sure. up to sure. a thousand families preparing to sue the Tavistock Clinic. Now we're seeing lots of people. There's one person called Richie Heron, who is a, a gay man who no longer has genitals, had the, his genitals removed on the advice of doctors who said, you're born in the wrong body. Uh, this is an absolute scandal. Yeah, it's, it's monstrous. It, it, it's 
it's just so unthinkably monstrous at every level. Yeah. You know, we're recording this. I'm in uh, Hungary right now. And I can tell you in no uncertain terms, the Hungarians do not want this to come to their country. I mean, no, I can one, would. This. no one would. I mean, the, the 99% of people in the UK won't want this. They're, they're just waking up to it now. But that's the way that this movement works almost by stealth. You know, it occupies these positions of power. It uses language that doesn't reflect what it actually means. And then before you know it, you're in a position where this stuff is happening and people don't understand why. I mean, look, look at it this way. You know, when we now point to evidence that shows that male rapists have identified as female and been transferred into female prisons where they have gone on to commit sexual assault. When you say that to most people, they think you're making it up. They don't think it's real. They don't think it could possibly be happening. And that's why it's happened, because it's it sounds like the stuff of fantasy. And th- now that more and more people are realizing that this is happening and once you go after their kids, I mean, that, you know, that's when things change, I think. So I, I'm getting the impression now that things are really changing. The tide is turning, but the activists won't give up out with, up without a fight. And they are, like I say, very, very powerful. I mean, look at it this way. In the UK, we've had a conservative government for the last 12 years, an ostensibly right-leaning government. And it's all happened under their watch, right? It doesn't matter which government you have in, right wing, left wing. This would this is going to happen in, in if the circumstances allow it. Now it may be in Hungary, I don't know too much about it, maybe that that isn't happening and that there are the necessary defenses against it happening, but that's not the case for most countries. Uh, and you know, particularly in the yeah. world. Yeah, I mean they're they're definitely trying to, to keep it out they have a few things going for them they have an in, unbelievably difficult language like on a whole new level of of complexity and difficulty and so um you know i was talking to people my jiu-jitsu coach was telling me that there's a great jiu-jitsu here and do you do jiu-jitsu do i do jiu-jitsu what a friend <laughs> do i look like jiu-jitsu. the sort of person who does that we got to we got to get you started right away. Uh get you out of the newsroom a little bit and get you on the mat. But he was telling me that he was talking to some young people and they were explicitly using woke language in English, which I thought was very interesting. And I was just in Austria meeting with some lawyers to help protect the society about against wokeism and they were telling me the same thing that they that the the words haven't translated into Hungarian. So they're just using the, the English ah. vocabulary. And uh, ju- just as a, as a quick aside, you know, I did a podcast with uh, Rajiv Maholtra, or Majib Maholtra, and I wrote a, the forward to his book, Snakes in the Ganga. And he talks about wokeism as a, a neo-colonial American export to India. I mean, it's an 864 page tome. It's a re- remarkable uh, 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 book. Okay, so one of the things that I loved about your book, The New Puritans, one of the things that I loved about that is your detail was incredible. Like you're talking about cases, case after. Nobody could read your book and come come away saying, oh, that's bullshit. Oh, that's not happening. Or there's not enough evidence for that. So I, I wanted to talk to you about that. Uh, first, how did you get all that? Inf- I mean, how, the, the the information was extraordinary in that book. Well, I thought it was really important because one of the key tactics is to say the culture war doesn't exist or the culture war is a right wing myth right. or that no one's getting cancelled or that all of these things is it's just scaremongering. So what I decided I would do is I would catalogue the, the lot of it. I would make sure that that there are sufficient number of examples so that that denial no longer stands. And as you know, there's extensive endnotes which source all of the stories so you can't well firstly i wouldn't have been able to write the book if it wasn't happening you know but but secondly you can't come away from that with this denialism it, it simply won't work and that's yeah and that and because and, that, yeah. and that's, that was my tactic there because i think unless you do that unless you present the evidence i mean i know the activists have given up on evidence-led epistemology but we can't uh, most people haven't so, you know, you said something there that I was just about the right. I was just reading this. I don't know. You're obviously from an island. You probably don't know about the. Um, do you know about NPR, National Public Radio? I've it, heard it's, of like, it. it's like the BBC on your island or on the other island of Australia. It's like the uh, ABC. Um, it's this ultra woke. I mean, 
it is orders of magnitude more woke than anything that the BBC has ever produced. Okay. Uh, oops, sorry about that. Uh, I shut off notifications, but I guess not all of them. Um, and so I was just reading this article today about critical race theory. And it's basically it frames the whole debate about critical race theory, like right wing people want to attack critical race theory. Yeah. As opposed to saying, OK, you know, like, why why are you you know it's it's so frustrating to me because that that just kept jumping out in your book again and again it's like if you don't want to engage an idea you just say oh well it's you know it's right wing people well, well i think the designations of are right- you a right wing person no <laughs> but 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 i don't think right and left means anything anymore i think the culture has killed it off i mean yeah. i think a lot of the people I know who oppose critical race theory are traditionally on the left. You know, yeah. most of the the vast majority of feminists who are opposing gender identity ideology are stalwart socialists, like you know, like so, Ellen Quackrose. Right, quite. I mean, it's, so it's 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 not the case that this can be reduced to right and left, but this is just another example of the kind of simplistic, reductive binary that people try and reduce it to because, you know, because that makes it comprehensible, I guess. But it's not. Look. Right and left, it's a hangover from the French Revolution. I, I, I guess if you, I still hold fast to the traditional definitions of those terms. I think if you're on the left, you have to be prioritizing issues of money and class and redressing economic inequality. And if you're not doing those things, you're not authentically left wing in any meaningful sense. The woke don't care about those issues. They prioritize group identity, race, gender, sexuality. They don't care about poor people, or at least they don't get, make much effort in that direction. Or if they do, it's just one element of a broader intersectional picture, as though class doesn't underpin everything. You know, So they're not, you know, left and right doesn't really work. And what happens now is the phrase right wing is just used as a smear right. in order to say, we don't need to talk to you. We don't like if, if you yeah, relate- we don't we we don't need to talk to you. We don't need to engage your arguments. Yeah. But it's I, I would argue. And I think actually you mentioned this midway in your book, if I remember correctly, it's 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 even worse than that because they want to regulate not only who you talk to, but other people who will talk to you because you've talked to other people. Oh, well, that's the guilt, guilt by association. Yeah, idea. It's like Absolutely this chain. Great. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, you know, Peter, that most of the people who talk to us in the media are probably from a more right leaning background because those on the left who, who identifies left won't talk to us. Right. So but I will talk to anyone about this stuff. And I, I you know, I, I, I think it's really important to open conversations up, particularly with those with whom you disagree. I think that's really important. On my yeah. show, yeah. I've got a TV show in, in the UK every Sunday and I always invite my Tell us the name of your show. The show is called Free Speech Nation and it's on GB News every Sunday at, at seven o'clock. And I always invite those who oppose me on and they, I get a bite, maybe one in every 20, you know, every now and then one of them will come on and we have a great conversation and it's not, you know, I'm not a combative type of person. I'm actually interested in dialogue, in understanding why people think the way they do. That's why I spend all my time reading their books and their articles, um, you know, it, and I think that's really, really important. But this idea of saying, because I work for a right wing, they call it a right wing channel, or they say, because I talk to right wing people, that means that I myself uh, am right wing. Well, even if I were, it wouldn't matter because I don't think being right wing is a bad thing. Um, but I'm, I, I happen not to be, but that's by the by. But it's really just a means to say we are now disobliged from having to speak to this person. We don't have to because that because that person is less than human. That person is not worthy of our consideration. That person is just a bigot. And of course, the people who throw the word bigot around the most are bigots, uh, because the very definition of bigotry is an intolerance of different opinions. They don't understand the definition, so they don't realize that it applies to them. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think this is, I think we have to move beyond left and right for this struggle it has to be about the conflict between liberty and authority. That's really what it is. And that's what John Stuart Mill talks about in On Liberty. It's that conflict. It's those who believe in individual autonomy and, and freedom against those who believe in state control, authoritarianism, et cetera. And, that's, and the woke, the, the closest synonym, synonym for woke, I think, is authoritarian or mm. anti-liberal. And I would say the closest synonym for anti-woke is liberal. Um, and that's the opposite of what people think, because they've been tricked into thinking that all woke means is to be alive to injustice. Well, we all are. So that's not what it means.
Yeah, it's interesting. I'm curious. Uh, somebody asked me, a reporter asked me the other day, if I considered myself a classical liberal. Hmm. Before I tell you what I said, what, how would you answer that question? It's muddied because in America, liberal means very, liberals almost become synonymous with left wing, yeah. which of course isn't what it means. In Australia, of course, the liberal party is perceived to be right wing. Exactly. So I, I go back to the original definition, the original idea of liberalism, as in this idea of liberal values being individual autonomy, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Uh, you know, I, I would say it's about, it's not an ideology. Social liberalism isn't an ideology in the way that Marxism is an ideology or critical social justice is an ideology because liberalism doesn't invite you, give you a set of rules to, to live by. What it says is uh, you can do what you want. You are free to do what you want so long as you don't encroach on the rights of others. And that's the, that's the principle behind it. Um, so I, I don't have much truck with this idea of, of it being ideological in basis. I think it's the opposite. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, th I think I think that that accords with my own intuitions. I actually, you know, I'm reading your book, and and every time I talk to you, it's amazing. It's kind of like I'm I'm talking to a mirror of myself. But I said, uh, but but one who you grew up on an island. But you know, I, I think um, uh, I said, you know, broadly, broadly, yes, I think that's the, the, the that that was just my take on it. Given that you're right, it's muddied and it's unclear. And I also agree with you. I think that the terms right and left are no longer meaningful are no longer useful in any any real or any meaningful way mm. in in the fault lines in the culture war I'll, I'll add a few things it's um it's how people engage each other now yeah. and i guess that does fall under the broad rubric of authoritarian or anti-liberal um and it's their relationship to truth and discourse and dialogue and i have seen I mean, as you know, I've been screaming about this stuff since 2012, 2013. And, you know, people thought I was a lunatic back then. They said, this is crazy. That You know, this is a few people and crazy departments. And friends. and then it just, that envelope, that umbrella kept expanding, you know, like, oh, well, you know, okay, it's just a few fringe departments. Oh, you know, okay, it's, it's, it's humanities. It's never going to get out. Okay. It's gotten out, but it's not. Bad. And then the next thing, you know, the whole society is engulfed by it. And so, you know, I, I think, I think, and you talk, we, we talked about this now and you talk about this in your book, the uh, hoodwinked by words thing. And I think that the word to use is hoodwinked there. Hoodwinked yeah. by equity, hoodwinked by inclusion in particular, hoodwinked by diversity, you know. And I look at some of the stuff I'm, I'm my my work here in Hungary, and I'm I'm trying to think about how to protect their institutions from this complete madness. Um, so so before I go on, do you have any thoughts about that? I think at the heart of it, uh, it is a commitment to the pursuit of truth, that will be the inoculation against this. Um, because the critical social justice movement doesn't just offer an alternative interpretation of reality, it offers an, a pseudo reality. It right. says that there are more than two biological sexes, which there are not. And, and it will infect institutions to an extent that now leading medical journals are making the claim that, that sex is a spectrum, when anyone who knows anything about biology knows that that is not true. In other words, they are prioritizing the world yeah. as they would like it to be over the world as it is. They're prioritizing ideology over knowledge. The, and that's so, a real problem. Let me just uh, pause you and say, so here's the difficulty that I have with, with this. Whenever you point this out to somebody, they say, well, why should I listen to you rather than the world's leading medical journals? Yeah. And that's, so it makes, it makes me look like a crackpot. Well, that's the problem, isn't it? You know, it wouldn't matter if, if these were just people on the fringes making these wild claims that are not verified by the data or by science, but it's people now at the very top who are ideologically captured making the claims. That makes it very difficult. Uh, just as, um, you know, we all know what the word woman means. It's an adult human female. It's someone who has the potential pro to produce large gametes or eggs. Um, we all know that. A moderately intelligent six-year-old could tell you that. Uh, but now we have scientists telling you, you know, that's not true. Uh, we don't have any evidence to, to explain why it's not true, but we're going to obfuscate and throw lots of jargon down. And then hopefully we, we can, you know, I mean, they're promoting the idea that we all have a kind of innate gendered soul. Uh, it's a pseudo religious belief that they're promoting. Um, and it is difficult when that's coming from the top. 
rather than from, yeah. just, you know, because then it's harder to fight. And now you have woke staff members at online dictionaries changing the definitions of terms in order to support that. So now they can say, well, wait a minute, actually, it means this. If you look at woman on Merriam-Webster, it now says something completely different. Or, or, or racism, they change the definition of that as power. They include power. And, and it's, yeah, exactly. it's really, it, it's, really it, it's a monstrously difficult battle, a war in which to engage. You know, I was heavily involved in the new atheism movement. That was actually relatively simple compared to this. Yeah. I mean, you have people changing the meanings of words. You have people literally in dictionaries pumping out charlatans, uh, pumping out um, peer reviewed literature, which is completely it's not robust. It's 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 cor- the whole fields are corrupted. Yeah. Entire bodies of literature. You have the ideological capture of academic institutions and basically every institution at this point the military medicine and again me pointing that out and it it makes me sound like like i'm someone like i'm a conspiracy theorist pointing to a vast conspiracy as opposed to the fact that there not only is there no evidence for this but there's actually evidence against this stuff yeah i mean that's why i wrote the book because it's all clear if you look at the evidence it's all clear what's going on um it's just that People, we've we've become accustomed to trust experts to defer to the judgment of those who've devoted their lives to the study of a particular subject, and that makes sense. If we didn't do that, how could we live? You know, we couldn't go to the doctor and ask for medicine or, or anything. You know, the whole educational process involves deferring is it, it, based on deferring to the judgment of those who know more than you. And all of a sudden, we're in a situation where those who know the most know the least. And, and yeah, it's it's it is scary. It's maddening, and it's and it's really really dangerous. So that the that's why I think institutions have to find a way to guard against it, to root this stuff out, because it's it is the antithesis of what those institutions are meant to represent. Yeah, in fact, I, yeah, that's right. In fact, the institutions couldn't even do their job if, for example, they don't hold merit as one of the core principles of the institution. Yeah. And and again, if you say that to somebody, it makes you sound like you're completely insane. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So so it, it's I mean, it, it's such it's such a problem. Okay, so you, so okay, so you got two two things that I want to ask you now. One is you talk in the book toward the end about solutions, and I want to talk about that a little bit, mm-hmm. and I want to broaden that to talk about it doesn't have to be Hungary in particular or Eastern Europe, but like. You, you know, I mentioned Raji's book, which was amazing, like, you know, maybe non-English speaking countries or countries outside the Anglosphere, English speaking world, or like, is your advice to them, to policymakers, to administrators, to PMs, is your advice to them the same as it is to your advice for people in the English speaking world about how to stop this utterly dangerous nonsense? It is so the reason why it spread so much in the English speaking world, I think, in the Anglosphere is because it is so rooted in the uh, in in UK and US academe, isn't it? It's so it's so it's so related to the linguistic tricks that queer theorists have played and, and, and this kind of thing. So although now I'm seeing more and more, I mean, I get a lot of messages now from people in Spain saying that it's really spreading in Spain at the moment. Um, All over the world now. Yeah, I mean, I know. Which is you made really- the point that in Hungary they don't translate the words. That's interesting because the you know I wrote a book under the pseudonym Titania McGrath, which is a satirical character, and that book was called Woke: A Guide to Social Justice. And the Hungarian translation of that, which I think is isn't out yet, but will be, is called Woke. They just use the same word um, because those words don't translate. Um, so in that sense, there is a kind of uh, linguistic, but because this is a war about language. In a sense, you've already got a, a shield if if you're not an English speaking country. There's already an, an, but that doesn't mean that shield can't be penetrated and won't be penetrated because, of course, it will be eventually. So I think, broadly speaking, the advice should always be the same. Um, uh, it's it's about guarding against the potential for hysteria before it before it manifests itself. And I do use the word hysteria accurately. I think I'm not. I don't use it lightly. Um, I think that's what that's what explains a lot of what is going on. I mean. When you're caught in a hysterical moment, uh, it's very difficult to break out of it because what it means is it it means that you have to admit to some terrible things. So if we take the example of the the kids situation, the trans 
children situation in the UK. We currently have, there's a group called Mermaids. Oh, the Mermaids, yeah. yeah. So Mermaids is a, a group that quote unquote supports trans children, vulnerable children, but it's recently been exposed as sending out dangerous chest binders to underage kids. These are really dangerous things that flattening parts of your body forcibly day in, day out leads to all sorts of problems, broken ribs, uh, exhaustion, all sorts of breathing difficulties. These are dangerous devices. And this group has been sending these out to kids without their parents' knowledge. It's also been directing children to other um, website forums, which are not moderated. Now, when it comes to child safeguarding, you have to be double checking, triple checking everything. You know, it's really important. They have a member of their trustees who is just outed as, 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 as writing academic papers that seemingly support paedophilic practices. Now, the thing is, all of this stuff you know, for, for child's for a child safeguarding group this is insane we recently had a court hearing where a representative mermaid had to admit that they hadn't read the cast report the cast report is the leading report into this area of child safeguarding and and gender identity they they should be the first to have read that um but they haven't read it they said something like oh we skimmed it you know they they, they claim they weren't giving out medical advice but so much of their advice has been adopted by the nhs you know, so, but if these people now, and you see them all doubling down at the moment you know, on Twitter, et cetera, if they were to admit that actually what they have done is effectively sterilized gay children or gender non-conforming children. Who can or, never have an orgasm again, by right, the way. Mutilated autistic kids, right? If, they have mutilated them. That is correct. If you're going to do that, you have to admit to something monstrous. And I don't think the human psyche does that with ease because- that's such an admission. It's surely easier to double down into the fantasy and say, no, I was right all along. It must be very painful because I imagine, I honestly do think a lot of these people have done this or have been hoodwinked into supporting this for good intentions, for good reasons. And now they have to admit that they've supported the mutilation of healthy kids. Well, that's that's gonna that's a big ask of anyone, you know? And, and one of the reasons, I mean, look, in my book, I try to make this accessible through an analogy. I call it the New Puritans because I draw an analogy with the Salem witch hunts. And I start the book with that and I finish the book with that. And the reason I've done that is because at Salem, I mean, this only lasted from, you know, it was February 1692 to May 1693. So just over a year, very short lived bout of hysteria in this small Puritan village in New England. Uh, God-fearing, decent Christian people, uh, not bad people at all. And, and you know, the, the Puritans of New England were not witch hunters. This isn't something they normally did. This was an aberration and it was short-lived. And all of a sudden, these girls in the village were pointing their finger and crying witch. And they said they saw the devil in the shadows. They saw local decent people signing the devil's book, drinking the, devil, drinking the blood of children, all this kind of stuff. They took them to court. And these people were executed as a result. 20 people were executed, five, further five died in jail. And, and when anyone said, I don't think this is real, they were accused next. And this is that how the hysteria works. And I think this analogy works really well. We all know what a woman is, but we all know that if we go online and say that there are only two biological sexes, we could be kicked off. We could be have our livelihood attacked. We can have activists going after our employer and saying, you shouldn't hire this person. This is a hateful transphobe. So everyone keeps quiet. In Salem, it went on as long as it did because people kept quiet for reasons of self-preservation. The analogy is really, really clear. But also because I think it tells us the way out of this. It came to an end when sufficient numbers of people stood up and said, no, there are no witches. You know, th this isn't real. This is a fantasy. I like to compare the girls of Salem to the activists of today. If these activists were just screaming online, crying witch or turf, transphobe, right. Nazi, whatever phrase they use, and we just ignored them, then it would be fine. There would be no casualties. The problem is that the elites, the people in power, truckle to their bidding, go along with this stuff, capitulate and say, yes, there are witches and we've got to help you to root them out. The, the politicians, the civil servants, the people in power, the academics, they're the equivalent of the magistrates and the ministers in Salem who didn't say to the activists or to the girls, no, you're wrong, this isn't real. They said it is real and we're going to help you root out the demons in our midst. That's the comparison. And it stopped because the girls started accusing 
magistrates, ministers, right. the elite. Yeah, you, the- yeah. I I love that you wrote that in the book, and then it changed. I think it was the president of what bought of the Harvard or someone you wrote. The acting president of Harvard, the, a guy called yeah. the Reverend Samuel Willard. They accused yeah, him, right. and the magistrates immediately said, "You must be mistaken." Right. They think, so, which suggests to me they didn't really believe it because the devil doesn't make those mistakes, right? It right. makes me. There was even a case in Andover, which was near to Salem, where they accused a very rich man, and he threatened to sue them. He threatened to act a defamation, and they shut up. So, and so it wasn't the case that these people fully believed them. They were caught up in a hysterical moment. Now, I think the elites of today are caught up in a hysterical moment, and I think that yeah. we can break out of this just as quickly if we follow the lessons of Salem. I think. Yeah. So, okay. So I. I hope you're right. I agree in principle. Obviously, it's more complicated because we have social media, we have idea laundering, they have their own journals, they have large scale swaths of society, institutions, government, media, et cetera, that they've captured. But I think a core, that principle is true. You just have to stand up to these people. And I I just released a a video series with Jody Shaw, the, the woman from Smith who had the I Have a Few Requests um uh video and she talks about you know like finding another person many people think when they start to get questioned about this they're crazy or they say oh geez am i really a racist or am i really a you know a a, a horrible a horrible person i have to be anti-racist you can never be enough anti-racist you can and i mean it's just it the whole thing is so incredibly I guess it's just the rapidity of it. It's just how quickly it consumed the whole society. Yeah. And those people who initially stood up um, for it, of course, they paid the price. But, you know, now I'm seeing many on the right adopt a uh, a similar posture, similar techniques like, you know, canceling. You know, some guy, Matt Walsh, had something, you know, I'm canceling Bogosian or whatever. I mean, like I see many people on the right adapt adopting many of the techniques of people on the left. Because, and that's because, clearly not the solution. Because, because it's not about right and left, as we've said. Exactly. It, it, that is just evidence that the instinct for authoritarianism is nonpartisan. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely everywhere. You see this from all sides of the political spectrum. It's something that we are you know, we are hopefully as a, as a, as a society socialized out of, right. That, that impulse for, to inflict cruelty, to, to, to demand power over others. I mean, that's never going to go away because there's something in the human instinct that, that has that probably because we come from primates, status seeking primates. We are primates. So yeah. power is important to us and the assertion of power. And, and that's why we have civilization and socialization. That's how we escape from that stuff. And this is an yeah. and that's why we have, yeah, jurisprudence and a body of laws, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And and that's why I'm also concerned about this stuff when I was in Austria, you know, leaking into the law, seeping into the law. So, um, all right. Well, I've, I've kept on. I really want to thank you for your book. It's fantastic. Uh, where can people reach you? Tell us. Tell us who publishes your book. Tell us when it will be. To just give it to us. OK, well, the book is called The New Puritans. I've got a copy here. Uh, How the Religion of Social Justice Captured the Western World. It is published by. Uh, Little Brown, well, Constable, which is an imprint of Little Brown. Uh, it's available online and all the b- usual bookshops, you know, Amazon and all the rest of it. Um, and there's been already been a couple of requests for tra- uh, translations into other Excellent. languages. And I'm hoping that will continue because, uh, you know, I I, th- I think it would be great if this got out there. And um, it does seem to, you know, the reviews have been fantastic and people yeah, are receptive. Been. Yeah. And, and that's really encouraging is that, you know, I knew that people would be attacking <laughs> me but actually i haven't yet had a hit piece on this book i've only had good reviews so i, I think it's methodically know. it's methodically sourced that's part of it i mean what would they what would they hit you on i again right. you're a nazi or something i mean i it, it i mean it's just so well sourced and so a resource and it's just example after i mean it's it's a treasure trove and i also think it's going to be interesting as i think the blurb like for future historians are going to look back and they're going to read your book and they're i mean it's just a remarkable moment of clarity after reading that book one of the things i do say towards the end of the book is that i hope this book will be obsolete really soon you know <laughs> within 10 years but if anything, like you say, at least there is a historical document of of the madness that we lived through. And, you know, I, I think when when you do lay it out in, in the way that I hopefully have and present all those examples, it, 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 you, you suddenly see the mess we're in, you know, because yeah. it's not just the odd tabloid story that you can dismiss as all oh, that sensationalist nonsense. You see the pattern and you see how dominant it is. It isn't just 
on the fringes. But I come back to this point. The woke are a minority in all societies and in all ages, in all age groups. This is often misrepresented as a battle between older people who can't keep up with changing norms and a new enlightened younger generation. The majority of the younger generation are also opposed to this. We have studies, we have evidence. So th that's a misnomer. That's not what this is. Uh, this is an authoritarian movement that is a minority everywhere. And just like the girls in Salem, they were a minority too. And if everyone in the village had just stood up at the same time and all those magistrates had said, no, it's not, it's not happening, it would have died overnight. And that's what should happen now. More people need to be brave. And although people are losing their jobs, and they really are, and, and being and turned into pariahs, being outcast for saying the truth, we can't be afraid of it. Collectively, safety in numbers, right? Collectively, if we stand up and oppose it, then it will end, or at least that is my hope. Yeah, and I think you've made a significant contribution to, um, you know, being a, a pallbearer in 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 the uh, corpse of the madness that's overtaking the society. So hopefully, your book will be obsolete. It can't come too soon. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you. Oh, and you're on Twitter, and uh, Titania's on Twitter at what? Titania's just Titania McGrath. Um, I'm on Twitter at uh, Andrew Doyle underscore com. And okay. you can find me there. Awesome. All right, man. Thanks a lot. And thanks for your work. And I genuinely appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Thanks so much, Peter. All right. We'll talk to you later, Andrew. Thank you.